welcome everyone um, and welcome Jonathan. Um, just as by way of introduction, um, the Association of Engaged Buddhists is a non-profit organisation formed by a group of lay Buddhist practitioners and supported by an ordained Sangha as our spiritual director, Bhante Tejadamo. We welcome all who think that they may benefit from learning and practicing meditation, who wish to find a different way of, at looking, of looking at life, or who simply are seeking for a supportive community within which to practice the Dharma together. We organize regular Dharma talks, meditation practice, and meditation retreats. We have a beautiful retreat center at the Southern Highlands of New South Wales called Vegisala, where we hold our retreats. Um, I went to the retreat there just recently and it was a re really beautiful small retreat with um, uh, the Akaliko. Mm -hmm. um, and the, re the renovations are amazing, so I highly recommend it. Um, if you are looking for a community to practice and learn, we wish to be able to support you mentally and spiritually in a safe, caring and supportive environment. If you haven't, please consider joining as our member and subscribe to our newsletter. As we are run solely based on donation, any generous support will be very much appreciated. All teachers are offering their teaching free of charge. So if you wish to offer dana to the teacher, you may contact us directly or make a donation through the website. Just indicate that it's dana for the teacher. For more information about the retreat, or how to support us, please check on our website and Facebook. And uh, Meredith will post the link in the chat later. So tonight we have Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Page, and I'm just gonna go back here. After last week's um, amazing uh, talk about climate change, we've got the four pillars of wellbeing. Um, Dr. Jonathan has been a medical oncologist for 36 years and enjoys endurance cycling. He began his meditation practice in 1984, but to his chagrin, he was largely an erratic practitioner until 2004, generally employing meditation as a last resort to manage innumerable life crises with variable impact. He was persuaded to be more diligent in his meditation with the onset of a more difficult to shift, shift despondency, particularly burnout mixed with depression. These were poorly managed by the orthodox medical establishment. Thankfully, over time, this crisis yielded to regular meditation and the comfort of the three jewels. So with that, um, I will in, pass over to you, Jonathan and um, listen very intently. Thank you. Oh, well, th thanks, Sarah, and thanks, Meredith, for the um, invitation uh, once again. Um, and uh, the, the, I will be giving a talk shortly after the meditation, I think, tonight. And uh, as you indicated, it's, it's a slightly different topic, but uh, as with the Dharma, everything is uh, interconnected, so there will be some, some overlap, which we can talk about. I'm talking about um, uh, the four pillars of well-being. Um, so the different ways of looking at well-being uh, by by introduction and uh, and well-being is um, as I heard the the other day, it's uh, it's it's become over the last 10, 20 years a, a hot topic, the phrase of well-being and people seeking her, her well-being and um, Internationally, it's an industry that's worth about a trillion dollars. You know, by the time you think about all the the books that people that read and the money they spend on different therapies and um, with variable benefit, and um, as I'll indicate in in the talk, uh, that the concept of well being is is often not clear in 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 people's minds, um, or even in our minds, or even mine. I mean, it's just like a lot of concepts. Um, uh, they are not fixed. I mean, that's one of the principles of the Dharma. These things are not fixed and often they vary from time to time. And what we think is well-being uh, one day is not the next. And it's like a lot of concepts. Uh, well, I'm almost giving the talk now. 
but I won't. Well, I will have the meditation to settle the mind. But well-being is something we can think about uh, during the meditation. Uh, not only well-being, but even more fundamentally, just being. The idea that um, that we are in a state of being um, or into being. Um, and it need not have been that way. We, we could have um, um, discovered that we were, we were not being. I mean, we have a choice. We might have, we might have ended up being or not. So that's something that um, has interested philosophers for a long time. How is it that we are or be, you know, that we exist? And um, because at least in the minds of some, you could imagine that uh, you didn't or that you had some other sort of existence. All of that means that we can focus on our actual existence, like uh, in the present moment, and uh, really focus on the nature of being. So, and I mean, this is fundamentally um, uh, the, um, you could say the four pillars uh, of mindfulness. So mindfulness fundamentally focuses in on the, on the nature of being, on the physical aspects, the, um, uh, the feeling tone, the psychological, the spiritual aspects, of being and um and we can only be in the present moment and so meditation and mindfulness take us to the to the present moment where we can enjoy the experience of being rather than reflecting on the past where which is a like a mythical place where we perhaps visited once in a uh, long ago or yesterday or, or a moment ago but it no longer exists uh, except in memory uh, and the future likewise. We often spend a lot of mental time there um, and all these distractions to the past and the future take us away from the actual experience of being. So they, uh, in a way, we have a certain amount of time of life, which is the, the period that uh, we call being. Um, and if we stray away from it mentally, we're, um, we're not experiencing life. It's like we're giving ourselves a... Um, an early mark, or it dilutes the experience of life. And uh, at, at some level, we're deciding, well, living in the present moment is not all that important. So I might drift off mentally, at least, uh, to another place where I don't exist. But anyway, that being said, um, let's, let's begin with a, a meditation for um, about 20 minutes, I guess. And you, you may be inclined to think, we'll begin with a mindful approach to the meditation. Uh, you can focus on your breath as a way to get into the present moment. Uh, that's very useful, as the Buddha said repeatedly, um, in which we experience ourselves. So you start to get into the present moment and then see if you can remain there and return to the breath if you get distracted and see if you can get some uh, inkling as to the nature of your own sense of being, of being alive. But that's what we're talking about, isn't it? It's, the, it's being alive. It's really, if we're alive, then we are in a state of being. So let's uh, begin the meditation and settle down and really enjoy it, have a deep experience, and then we'll come out of it. And then once we fully emerge from meditation, we can begin the, um, the talk discussion.
All right, everybody. Uh, well, thanks again for inviting me, and I hope you had a, a deep and uh, tranquil meditation. And I think uh, in terms of the topic of uh, well-being and being, I think there's no better way than to experience being or to come close to it than, than through meditation, um, where we can go beneath the, the word being and get a real feel for what it's like to, to be or to live, to exist, to be alive, um, to get a sense of what's real. So all these aspects, I think people are very concerned about in their life, because as I will say, all right, so everybody can see that. So the four pillars of uh, well-being. I think I think four pillars is kind of nice because it supports the notion of being. And if we look underneath the, the concept of being um, to see what's under there, uh, then these four pillars, um, where am I? Oh, I'll get to them in a minute. But the four pillars will become uh, self-evident, I think. I think if you do, if you research the topic, you find that because well-being is such a big industry, there's so many books and pretty much every teacher in the field has their own classification or they borrow other people's. And um, and that's, that's, that's a good first step. But people are, in, are not inclined really to think deeply. And I think one, one aspect of Buddhism is that we're encouraged uh, as all the lamas say, and um, the late Thich Nhat Hanh would say that often, we must think deeply, and we and and that's that's difficult. We have to learn how to think deeply, because it means firstly you have to take, uh, in my view, take charge of your thoughts, and not be dominated by them, and indeed even have a thought-free mind when you begin the process of deep thinking, because you want to focus. You want your attention and awareness to focus on the topic or on the theme, um, even though you're not in in charge because you get you you're going into an area where which is completely new, and you're just beginning the exploration of what's there. I mean that's the nature of meditation, isn't it? We just don't know where it will lead, um, but it it takes us somewhere, and uh, and that somewhere can be very real. Now. The four pillars, um, so we're considering the nature of being, which is pretty fundamental, and, and the wonders of well-being. So being itself, I mean, it can be well-being. Uh, that's one type of being. There can be other types of, of being apart from well-being. Um, and there could be lots and lots of words. I mean, and even well-being, if we, say, if we feel that we're in a state of well-being, well, I mean, we, we could write thousands of pages about that. I mean, the word well doesn't really encompass what it's like. And that um, is something I'll mention a little bit later, the nature of words, because being and well and lots of any word really, love, all these words are just little uh, icons or symbols of, of what is beneath the word. Because, I mean, love doesn't really tell us very much. What we're interested in is what is what is signified by love? What is the experience of love? And um, and the word love just in a, in a way just opens a door to a vast room, doesn't it? Behind, and it just that means that on the door is the word love, and then you step into the room, and wow, it's whatever love is at that moment. So the same with uh, being and well-being. Now the um, Particular four pillars, I think they've been around for a while. I mean, the concepts like awareness is one of them. As you'll see, that they're well-established concepts, but they're just put together um, as a in a way because they mutually um, support the concept of well-being. And I think um, there were many people involved in this process, and I, and I think it goes back for as long as Buddhism has been around. But just collected recently, I guess, I think one of the people was... Um, um, a Tibetan monk you may know, Yangi Mingu Rinpoche. I mentioned him again. And also there's a Professor Richard Davidson, who's a, uh, like a, a, neuro, a neuroscientist who's been around and he studied and, and a Buddhist. And uh, so he's been studying the, uh, the, if you like, the neurology of uh, Buddhist states. So in other words, he could be looking at what, what's happening 
within the brain of people that are who are meditating. So you're probably aware of this, this sort of, uh, this is where science meets the spiritual, you know, and um, uh, some people are very interested. I'm interested in what he does, but I, I don't think looking at scans of people who are meditating, um, no matter how sophisticated the scan is going to tell us very much about it. Because it's just tell it's just showing us, uh, for example, about the movement of energy in the brain or the nerves that are firing, but it doesn't tell us how people are feeling or why they're feeling. And so there is this big difference. It's often called the heart problem. You can see what's happening in the brain in a certain part and think, okay, someone could be telling you, someone could be in the machine, in the scanning machine, and um, and and Professor Richard uh, Davidson or one of the other thousands of people nowadays studying this sort of thing is I want you to develop the feeling of compassion. And sometimes I might show an image of a baby or you might have your own picture of someone who you love, your own baby, and uh, and then you tell him or his assistant, yes, I'm, I, I can feel I can feel compassion. Okay, and then he says, well, just keep that, try and sustain that. And then he's looking at the scan. So he's looking at the scans of your, of your brain and he can see the, on the screen what, what he would see is uh, what looks like a glow or a light or an image or a color in some part of the brain. And so he can say, okay, when you feel compassion, I can see where the compassion is in the brain. And then he can correlate the two. Now, if he got, um, um, often because he works in a university, he might use a university student to come in and that university student could be a young man or woman. He's got a very distracted mind. They're on social media. Um, you ask them to feel compassion. They, they would not have an idea about compassion. They don't know where their feelings are. They don't know what it means. Um, but you could find someone who has uh, some idea. Maybe they don't, can't feel compassion, but they, they can just tell you how they're feeling at that moment. And maybe they're angry. And say, okay, all right. In that case, we'll study your brain from the point of view of anger. But then they could get someone into the machine who's been a meditator for uh, on and off, like most of us, for, for years and years. Um, but not a truly serious monastic meditator. And then and and the and so someone like Professor Davidson would would notice a difference when they feel um, compassion um, or kindness. Uh, there would be a much bigger effect in the brain. There'll be more of the brain involved and the, the, the screen would show a much deeper or brighter light. And then if they got in um, a, um, a monastic lama who's been meditating for 40 years, every day, maybe three hours a day, every day for 40 years, then uh, the, the findings on the scan are truly amazing. I mean, almost the entire brain is occupied with um, the feeling of uh, whether it's compassion, or some other state that's beyond words, uh, we just don't know. So he's very much involved and um, he's, he founded the Center of Healthy Minds. So he's, his, his practice from his Buddhist perspective in particular is, is to help people develop healthy minds. And therefore, uh, and of course we can talk about what healthy means, um, healthy minds and how that could allow people to develop a state of well-being. Now, and uh, there were others involved and um, including various, particularly in the US, but also in Europe. So people, the various um, senior monastic people and all the different uh, uh, lineages of Buddhism were involved. Now, but I, I was particularly um, moved by Yongi Minga Rinpoche. I didn't know very much about him. And then uh, he published a book. I don't know if any of you know of him, um, but he, that, that's, so he's about late 30s or 40. This is him. Um, so what, what the reason that he attracted me is that he undertook a, an almost spontaneous um, um, retreat, but it, but it was in the traditional Buddhist uh, uh, walking retreat. 
that uh, that is often that, that is that was undertaken at the time of the Buddha, and I guess you could say the Buddha did that himself. And we know people in our own time, um, uh, Sajato, who uh, you know, uh, from memory, when he left the Santi Monastery, he went on um, a retreat or an odyssey. Um, so people do that, and it's often spontaneous, and um, and they don't have to be Buddhists to do it. People sometimes just feel compelled to disappear uh, into, into some sort of wilderness. People do that. They disappear, and uh, often uh, it's not clear why they do it. But young Iminga Rinpoche, he, he, when prior, prior to, prior, he left. The, uh, I'll tell you a bit about him in a minute. But he was, uh, he was a, um, he looked prosperous. He was a monk. He was born into a, um, a family of great monks. His, his father was a tulku, so he was a reincarnated uh, um, individual in, in this life, reincarnated from a, an enlightened lama from the past. His, his brothers were all Rinpoches. They were all abbots of great monasteries. Uh, they traveled the world. They were all uh, giving talks. Uh, they were on uh, YouTube. This is like back probably about 2012, 13, 14. And, and so they had a big presence. Um, I mean, they they, they weren't on um, primetime TV, but, you know, there were hundreds of people who were interested and they, and they were very passionate and devoted and articulate. They spoke many languages. And so he was one of those and he was, uh, he looked prosperous and was probably about 10 or 15 kilos heavier. And that's a picture of him taken and he's bearded there and uh, unwashed and wearing clothing um, and uh, is very skinny. He'd lost uh, so much weight. So um, so he wrote a, a book called In, uh, In Love with the World. And then it was a, a monk's uh, travels through the bardos of living and dying. Um, so the bardos being that period of time between um, uh, dying and reincarnation. But he's using it here metaphorically. So he, um, as I mentioned, he was a very prominent lama. Uh, he was the abbot of some uh, of a prominent monastery in uh, Kathmandu, and also at Bodh Gaya in India. Spent a lot of time there. And so he was in um, Bodh Gaya. He was uh, about to lead a, a teaching session, an entire curriculum that went for two years, and. Um, but he had in his mind for um, a month or two that that something was going on inside him and he was going to walk away. He was going to leave and then go on this retreat. In retrospect, he told people that he thought he'd probably be away for a few years. But I think it was a retreat without end. And he didn't know what he was seeking. And um, but he did know that he he that he had that he was not living. He was not living in a deep sense with the fundamental nature of life. And, uh, and, he, and he had to, had to go on this, uh, this retreat. I guess others might go on a, into a retreat in a cave or in a forest, and it may be indefinite because they stay there until they feel that they've discovered whatever it is they need to discover. And this is sort of the essence of the spiritual practice. So he, um, he prepared. He left during the night. He wrote a long letter. The letter is actually uh, available online, uh, the English version of it. He wrote it in um, Tibetan. He had his own personal assistant who brought him the breakfast, left it at the door, and then came back later, and uh, nobody had eaten the breakfast, and he had left. So he'd only taken a, a small backpack. Um, he left in his monastic, robe, monastic robes, and... Um, because he spent quite some time, he said, uh, hours, he, should he wear them? But he always wore them. And so he felt this resistance against changing out of his robes into something more anonymous. Um, and so he left and walked. And, uh, but he said in the letter, do not try to follow me. Because he knew he was so well known. He knew that wherever he went, people would see him in the street and acknowledge him. And um, he had a little bit of money, and he actually stayed in um, in in hotels, little cheap hotels, uh, for the first couple of weeks until he ran out of money. And then he then had to change into the clothing of a um, mendicant, 
of a homeless, penniless mendicant. Of, uh, and if you've been to India, then you see hundreds of these, these people wandering around. He had an arms bowl. And so he was just like uh, Akaliko um, and um, Sajado when they're in town and they go on their, their morning arms round. So he was doing that. And I mean, this is a very senior, eminent uh, monk. So these were all transitions because he was seeking a sense of what it really means to be. And then, and then, and then later on, he would determine what it means to, to enter a state of well-being in a very deep sense. And so this, this impressed me because it was, he documented it for the benefit of others. Um, and so he left, and, and it's, and, but he was aware of this um, very difficult transition where he had to forget about his eminent status uh, and even though he was a monk and, and had developed a sense of non-self, he was still aware that there were hundreds of people looking after him and paying attention to him. And, and this, um, the presence of such wonderful people still had created a barrier between himself and, and the nature of his own life. So, uh, so that's what he did. So he left. Um, but soon after, and then he, but he, so he left from Bodh Gaya, which, uh, as you probably know, is uh, south of the Ganges in the sort of um, north east of the country. And so he went north in the direction of the Ganges up to, to Varanasi. And then he was going to go from there to, uh, there was a fairly standard pathway, actually. Uh, many people begin their, um, their journeys from Bodh Gaya because they might go to Bodh Gaya. And, and spend some days there. It's such a holy place. And then, then they travel north to Varanasi, another holy city, and then go up to um, Kashangar, which is where um, uh, the Buddha died. And there were hundreds of mendicants up there. So that's where he went. But he got very sick and, uh, and almost died. Um, and by the time he got up there, he'd grown a beard, he'd lost weight, he was, his clothing was dirty. And he was almost anonymous. And so people didn't know him and he was like anyone else. Um, and, and so mendicants really take their own life into their hands. Um, people don't um, really look after them very well. And that's something that uh, this gentleman discovered. So, um, and then he returned. But it was four years later and um, his brothers were uh, distraught. They had their own commitments. And so I, I've seen the a YouTube presentation of one brother who was uh, who presented like a, a few days after he learned that his brother um, Mingo had left. He didn't know where he was. He he, he feared for his life, and so he was presenting a talk and uh, but was weeping because he was so upset. So that that uh, that impressed me and moved me that someone would do something that I wouldn't do. Um, and he demonstrated in his book that he realized there was only one way to do this. He had to do it in this life. So now I think I might've showed this slide last week, but it's, um, that shows the, um, the overlap. So that's, uh, you can imagine that people do have simplistic thinking. We all do. And it includes the thinking about well-being and what we're doing and uh, who we are. Um, it's this sort of human way, you could say. But even when we say human, what do we mean by that? And so there's, a, there's often a simple uh, direction where most people are heading and, and most people follow that, of course, and we often do ourselves. We just go along with, with the rest. Um, but there's usually at some point, uh, the answers are present. They, they, may not, they may be obscure in a book, but it, it could be that there's a person sitting here who has the answer. So that's the answer. So that's what uh, Minga Rinpoche was seeking, the answer. because he, he didn't want to just continue to head in this direction. Um, and so the complex and deep answer is often the correct one for each individual. And so uh, you go up this winding pathway up a hill and there aren't very many people up that, up that way. So um, last week I was talking about uh, choosing smaller eco footprints, but also that's a process where in a sense, if we're starting to consume less and less, that's this process of, um, uh, of, of monasticism, of seeking the truth, being able to sit with yourself under a tree 
eat less, move less, disturb the world less, and then it improves with the sense of well-being. So that's why I put that slide up there. And it seems so obvious. And because it's so obvious, um, can you read that? I hope you can understand that as well. So I put that there as um, to introduce a bit of joviality, but also uh, so often the elephant in the room is the um, is the issue at hand, and 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 sometimes you feel sorry for this elephant in the room because the elephant's got its own life, and um, perhaps the elephant has the answer. I mean, it's often animals, other species, a, a tree or some other animal that has the answer to our own sense of um, of, of desperation and wanting to know what what it's about, because sometimes when you meditate, you realize that that you're in a state of being, but so is a tree. And often it's the tree that can give you the, um, the explanation. So, um, so the phrase well-being is often loosely used in common daily speech, uh, as with other words like love and kindness and happiness, with the true profound meaning behind the spoken word. And that's, that's where the answer is. Uh, it's often lost, uh, lost, never fully encountered, and thus uh, has no real spiritual impact. Um, thankfully, there are many traditional meditation techniques available to explore and understand the sense of being and therefore um, attempt well-being. Because we may have an unsatisfactory uh, dukkha-ridden state of being, and we want this to change. I mean, this is the essence of Buddhism, isn't it? And so we want to stop suffering and enter a state of well-being. Now, there are, this is not unusual, and in, the, in, in ancient Greek uh, philosophy, which was being developed at about the same time as the Buddha. So there is this concept of an axial age where great wisdom is appearing at different points. So there, there are two states that I think are worth considering. One's called ataraxia, and that's a Greek word um, where A is, is, is a negative of the, um, um, of the word terasso for trouble. So it's a state where there is no trouble. It's a wonderful state. And so Epicurus described it as the most, the, well, he said the most pleasant life is one where we abstain from unnecessary desires, untroubled by mental and emotional disquiet and achieve an inner tranquility, calmness and serenity. So that's the state of ataraxia. By being content with simple things and choosing pleasure of philosophical conversation with friends. So in other words, if you like talking, but meditating with friends. So that's, a meditative description, which is not that different from some concepts of um, Buddhism. And then eudaimonia is also Greek, and the eu means good, as in uh, euphemism, and daemon is, uh, is, the, is the life spirit. So it's a condition of human flourishing. So it's, it's happiness through flourishing. So the four pillars, these are the four pillars. And um, as with the Four Noble Truths, um, they come in a sequence, but they're related to one another and they interact. And so they're not separate. So awareness, connection, and I've, I've extended that to interconnection or interbeing, and then insight and purpose in life. So they can be developed further, much, much further and deeper, and they're mutually uh, enhancing. So awareness, and also we, we must also consider awareness of awareness. So it's paying attention, self-awareness, being focused. And uh, there is this notion that a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. So the wandering mind is what can torment us and what, what troubles people if it's so wandering that they're out of control, that their mind is out of their own control. Uh, and this is so common. And so during this state, we may reflect on past interactions in the past, as I mentioned before, or expectation about future events. There's often judgment there, self-evaluation, which is often negative, and uh, with greed, hatred, and uh, delusion all thrown into this thing. And we've got no control over it. And so we're not really aware. We're not aware of even what's going on in our mind. We just feel lousy. 
Um, and we don't see reality in its fullness, splendor and effulgence. Effulgence meaning a really brilliant light. And this leads to suffering because we're not really encountering the state of being alive. Uh, we don't have a sense of ourselves. So our fundamental nature is in a, in a state of distress. And so a stable mind um, allows us to enter calm abiding, awareness and joyfulness. And that's really one of the purposes of, um, of meditation. And so um, Martin Aylward, who you may know, he's, he's um, a very impressive young man who lives in France. He, um, uh, he, he wrote a book last year called Awake Where You Are, The Art of Embodied Awareness. So he leads retreats. He has a big presence online. Um, and he says, awareness may include unconditional loving, compassion, equanimity, discernment, accepting everything. In other words, all inclusive. Because awareness, um, being fully aware is, uh, as he says, you, it's just simply noticing what's there. You have direct contact with uh, the phenomena of life as they arise. I mean, there's just no intervening thoughts. You're just simply aware of what is there. And, and, what, you, what, and what you are aware of is uh, dependent origination. So as we fully understand this verity, the central truth, we find that we can make room for whatever appears in consciousness. We can see it all. And we, wel we welcome all that experience, whether it's positive or negative, with equanimity. And so you, you may be aware of the, um, this poem, The Guest House. Is anyone uh, familiar with that? Yeah, you probably are. But it's, it's relevant, even though it was um, Sufi inspired by Rumi uh, about 700 years ago. So this, this being human is a guest house, every morning a new arrival. So we're in a state of awareness, phenomena are arising in our mind, a joy, a depression, a meanness, a momentary awareness, there we are, comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He or she may be cleaning you out for some new delight, the dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. So, I, so I, I had a friend um, a few days ago who was speaking to a friend of hers whose mother had died. And so when my friend heard about that, she told me that it, it, it aroused all her own feelings of grief um, at the death of her own parents over, over several years. So she was concerned by that. But you see... Um, that's an example of this phenomenon. Whatever arises, arises for not only a reason, but hundreds of reasons that we are not aware of. All the various causes and conditions. So whether it's a grief, um, even a depression or an anxiety. I mean, uh, we just accept them. We, we, we may name them, but we're aware that there's more to the feeling than the simple word. And uh, having that feeling, I, 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 um, I've discovered that there's um, a unique quality about sadness. Because sadness is not debilitating, usually. You can carry it lightly. And I find that um, if one is happy or happy with sadness, and you can be that, you can have happiness and sadness. Because you can be sad because you're just aware of the disappointments in life, um, the grief that you still hold for people that have died. And you're not trying to push it away. You just retain it as manageable sadness. And in that way, you connect with others because that's a universal quality. So in other words, we don't have to try and strive away from sadness to become happy. We can just be content with sadness if that's the natural state. Now, the second pillar is connection or interconnection or interbeing. So these are emotions that underpin um, successful relationships or the awareness of relationships with others. So we have the feelings often of kindness, gratitude, empathy, and compassion. So the four Brahma Viharas, which, are, which arise 
with connection and they allow connection to occur. We understand that in a connection uh, in a deep way, and we often have to travel deeply beneath the words um, into silence. But it's often in silence where the true meaning uh, of these words and concepts arise. Now, I, I did hear a talk a little while ago by a, um, uh, a venerable from Sikkim, who's a professor as well. And in, in Sikkim, um, they have a sense of interconnection with all life in the forest, the Sikkim being in the Himalayas. And um, this, this academic Buddhist uh, had written a book called The Chili and the Bears Are My Uncles. And that meant that people see the chili which they eat, so it's a, it's a, it's a food item like it is here, and bears are in the forest. So these are members of the family. They regard them as family members. Uh, and that's just a reflection of the interconnection that they have. So they feel totally part of the natural world. And of course, Thich Nhat Hanh really introduced the word into being, um, which arose during his experiences in the, um, what we call the Vietnam War, but they call it the, the American War. And he wrote a poem about interconnection. It's called Interrelationship, a poem, because he was a great poet. And this poem, this short poem goes, you are me and I am you. Isn't it obvious that we inter are? You cultivate the flower in yourself so that I will be beautiful. I transform the garbage in myself so that you will not have to suffer. I support you, you support me. I am in this world to offer you peace. You are in this world to bring me joy. So that's an image I found, which uh, I thought signified uh, interconnection on a grand scale. And um, are you familiar with Indra's net? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, 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 that is the ultimate symbol, really, of interconnection, isn't it? Um, even though it's not strictly Buddhist, it was incorporated as, uh, as a brilliant metaphor in, um, in some of the suttas. And uh, even here, you can see the reflection of the other uh, buds and drops of dew in each one of these uh, individual drops of dew. So this is the inherent interconnection of all things. And this extends into the universe. So the third pillar is insight. And this can relate to... Um, uh, the concept of vipassana, which is a type of meditation, as you know, which uh, is, is in, intended to uh, induce insights. So with deep awareness of the nature of being in this world, so that's the first pillar, and the associated universal interconnection, we may then develop a luminous insight into the nature of this human experience. So insight is the clear inner view into our internal realm, it's a state of introspection and the luminous penetration into the nature of reality itself. So, um, so um, of course, Buddhism is rich with insight. So the Buddha's enlightenment was the ultimate insight. In the, in the Buddha's first teaching, he declares, there is this noble truth of suffering, Dukkha. And then he says, such was the insight. He says that. Such was the insight, the knowledge, the understanding, the vision, the light that arose in me about things not heard before. And that's the nature of an insight. You never have the same insight twice. Likewise, the noble truth of the origin of suffering, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering were insights to be fully penetrated and to be fully known. And the noble truth of the middle way leading to the cessation of suffering the Noble Eightfold Path discovered by the Buddha was another vital insight. And you probably know uh, of Dogen, the, um, the great Zen master of the 13th century, founder of the Soto School. He said, um, directly upon encountering the Dharma, we will abandon the law of the world. As the Dharma is the uh, law of the spirit or of um, existence. Uh, once we discover the true order behind the appearance of things, our lives will no longer be dominated by the conventional values of society, the seeking to outshine, outrace, and to outgain. So he said that 
700 years ago. Nothing much has changed. Uh, to study the self is to forget the self, said Dogen. If you try to find who you really are, you may discover you're not there at all. The Dogen also said to forget oneself is to be actualized by all things. But to forget oneself, to lose the constructed self, then allows yourself to um, be actualized by the by the universe, by all other things, because you become part. You then realize that you are part of everything else rather than an isolated self. And uh, boy, a third poem. You're very fortunate getting all these poems tonight. So this is from T.S. Eliot, um, who was, a, um, I think, a closet Buddhist. Uh, so this is from his long poem, The, uh, the Four Quartets, Little Gidding. Um, we shall not cease from exploration. And at the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. Not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard in the stillness between two waves of the sea. Quick, now, here, now, always, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. So it is this total commitment. That's all. So simple. And then you suddenly know the place where you began. I was going to say uh, just a little bit about Charmata, I think. But I was saying, uh, I was going to mention also that sometimes insight manifests as, a, as an epiphany. The people, whether or not they're Buddhist or have any particular faith, um, are vulnerable to epiphanies, which can be looked at as um, the intrusion into their mind of reality. And many of you may have had an epiphany. I mean, sometimes they occur in dreams, but where, where dreams uh, where we don't have the, the conscious power because we're not conscious you know, to suppress reality, and it can emerge. But it can during the day. We can see uh, have a brilliant flash. There are great poems. Often these epiphanies arise to poets, or they can turn people into poets, where they suddenly realize uh, the nature of reality. It can happen during um, uh, like periods of uh, deep uh, romantic love. You know, that's one of the great attractions, I think, of romantic love. It's that um, often epiphanies abound. But epiphanies can be very startling because um, it can upset people. You know, to see the, the way the world is, even if it if the world appears really lovely, it can be overwhelming. And often people are very um, disinclined to share their experiences. So I was just going to mention shamatha. There, there, there are just two states that are related to Vipassana and um, important in uh, the pathway to insights. So shamatha is a, a state of tranquility. There's, there's so much written about it and classifications of it, and people can spend long periods in shamatha developing this abiding in mind, in mindfulness or calmness. And so it has these five characteristics. Um, it's an effortlessly stable attention. So you're very relaxed with stable attention in the mind. And it's, it's powerfully mindful, joyful, it's tranquil, and there's equanimity present. And then that allows the mind then to be very open to the uh, presentation of reality. And that's when insights can occur. Then I'll just go on. The, the second is, um, is bhavana, which you're probably aware of. It's, it's related. And it's, um, it's also a helpful state because, um, and the Buddha felt it was very important and he described it often, um, and it literally means a state of development uh, or cultivation. It, it's said by um, uh, one author that the Buddha chose cultivation because he was often talking, he was, he was in a rural environment, he was talking to, to people who were farmers and were familiar with the cultivation of a field. And so the cultivation of one's mind is to prepare the mind to allow the growth of insight. And of course, in the countryside, in a, in a state of cultivation, is where you see life arising. You know, as a crop, as individual plants uh, arise through the soil. 
And so that's a little bit like an insight. And so it produce so cultivation or producing the sense of calling something into existence. So spiritual cultivation. So that's what we do. We all do this. And it's often combined with other phrases. So chitta bhavana is the cultivation of the heart mind or metta bhavana, the cultivation of loving kindness. So pana bhavana, samadhi bhavana, even uh, vipassana bhavana, you're creating the conditions in your meditation, perhaps on a retreat. That's why we go on retreat. And the retreat is a period of bhavana while we're of cultivation. Now, these are examples of, um, example, the young uh, Buddha, I, I imagine, because uh, it's not my, my painting, looking at the flower and then suddenly realizing what the flower represents, suddenly realizing this is a flower. And um, I've seen Thich Nhat Hanh giving talks where there's usually a flower in a vase that he takes out of the vase with his hand and then tells us that within this flower uh, is the sun and the clouds and the mountains are all in this flower and uh, implying that it's the same with us. And the final um, pillar is, the, is purpose in life, meaning in life, so a clear direction in life uh, with associated values in the sense that life has meaning, that we matter, that we belong here, that we're not strangers. Um, and so uh, Philip Moffat, who's a, a prominent American author who wrote this wonderful book, he said that the development of uh, right concentration, one of the Eightfold Paths, supports right intention, right thought, speech and action. And this leads to a feeling of collected purpose, so that we're here with a purpose in our life. So it's, it's, it, it arises naturally once we follow the Eightfold Path. Just to return to the uh, modern world and, um, uh, and medicine, people that have a purpose in life, as determined by say, a uh, psychologist, um, they do tend to recover from many negative events in their life, so whether it's grief or depression or even physical illness or recovering from COVID. If someone um, has a strong sense of purpose and meaning, they recover more and they're far better able to cope with being isolated, as are people who are uh, meditators. So um, I'll only say uh, the purpose is, relates to intention, aim, goal, and, and meaning is tangled in there too. It means to be of some account. Um, the Dalai Lama said that uh, the development of deep compassion leads to a meaningful life. And I think that's true. And I think uh, we realize that compassion is a, very, is a major component of, uh, of uh, meaningfulness. And, and, and in some ways, it can be the purpose of our life. Um, so meaning and purpose in life can arise by fully recognizing the reality of anatta, non-self, anicca, impermanence, and the essential interconnection which I've mentioned already, of interbeing, of all life and all existence, and simply to rest in that ultimate awareness. There's nothing in particular we need to do about it. We just notice it, and once we notice it, we realize we're alive and we can just rest in that, uh, if, if, if at all possible. Um, and, this, and this was a state called eudaimonia, as I mentioned. It, it was this state of human flourishing, but it meant people could be content and calm. They didn't have to strive. They didn't have to achieve things. I mean, that really is the problem with the world today. People are overachieving. And people have excessive, an excessive sense of entitlement to do what they do. And they also, in the modern world, have a sense that they are separate from the rest of life. And they have lost the sense of uh, interconnection. And there, you're probably familiar with this poem by the uh, Tessitarata, uh, by Max Ehrman. This is just one, one phrase. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. 
You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here, you belong. And I want to finish by just mentioning, uh, if we're talking about meaning, then the, the name Viktor Frankl comes to mind because he wrote this wonderful book, Man's Search for Meaning in 1946. And so he, he lived a long life. He, he survived the Holocaust as a psychiatrist, um, but his pregnant wife, his mother, father and brother all died in the concentration camps. Um, but he survived. And I discovered that even before when he was um, a medical student in the late 1920s, he, he organized a youth counseling center or more more than one, because he had noticed there was a high number of teen suicides. And so he already had this, um, this sense of spirituality and, um, uh, and, and the qualities I've mentioned, the interconnection and purpose in life. So in Auschwitz, where he remained, uh, his other family members were taken elsewhere, he identified this state of uh, self-transcendence an essential spiritual freedom that remains when everything else is taken away, um, including those we love. And this gives meaning and purpose. He also had, he also felt it was, he had the purpose of remaining alive so that he could bear witness to what he saw. He didn't know how long he would live or if he would live, but he thought if he survived the camps, he had to be someone, because there weren't many who survived, who could tell a clear story so that everybody else would know. So that's, uh, that's, there's some interconnection, I think, peace, tranquility, and belonging. And I'm not going to, I think that's for each to interpret in their own way. And so the last slide. Uh, the wonders of well-being with deep awareness of the nature of being in this world and the associated universal interconnection we may develop a luminous insight into the nature of this human experience which in and of itself may provide purpose and meaning in life so i'll leave it there and um, we've got uh, some time to have a discussion and uh, questions or you can just uh, you can say anything you want. So thank you for being so attentive. Thank you very much, Jonathan. There's a lot to uh, think about there for sure. If anyone has any comments or anything they'd like, questions they have for Jonathan, please unmute yourself. <laughs> Jonathan, I related to that uh, quote from the Dalai Lama about how, <clears throat> excuse me, developing a deep uh, sense of compassion can also bring a person to a deep sense of purpose in life. And I see that um, in many of the activists that I've, I've known, you know, just for an example, say some of the Aboriginal activists who who fought for a greater recognition of their people and better conditions for their people. But it's how do you um, balance that with the sense of not striving too hard? Uh, because you know the very conditions that you fight against. Um, don't change easily you know those those people who are fighting this may go through their whole life without seeing any discernible progress um so how how can you um balance those two things well that's a really good question that's well that's almost fundamental and um and i'm glad you mentioned our, our indigenous uh, brothers and sisters um because we we're all at this moment becoming more and more indigenous, whether we like it or not. I mean, they're striving to save their world um, and they have been for 250 years. Um, and and we, we are now beginning that process belatedly saving the rest of the world. 
uh, well, the world we've taken away that we've colonized from indigenous people all over who had uh, cared for the world. Um, so so I, I think one of the answers is that we, we may have to go humbly to our indigenous um, brethren and ask them how they did it. How they were able to stay together and love one another and, and, and be loved and love their world, their, their country. And, 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 and experience and hear of terrible things happening, awful, awful blood, bloodshed happening, dispossession, and survive for that length of time. And, uh, and goodness me, when I, when I see, when I see the, the, uh, the activists, as you do, I see the spirit, I see the, um, their engagement with the world, I see the quite often the polite, forgiving way they they interact with the white people that have come along. Uh, and so I think we can only ask them because it is um, it's the it's this process of engagement, being an engaged Buddhist, isn't it? That we have to interact with the world, but compassion is the key to survival. I mean, we we're acting through compassion, in my, in my view, and. Um, Compassion is self-sustaining, but you still need periods of time to relax and recover. And you've got to pick your battles uh, through wisdom. And, um, and you've got to expect disappointment. And I mean, if we look at the um, Aboriginal history since so uh, of white settlement, um, you know, so many died. Because I, I read that um, in the year 1800, it was thought that there were around about a million indigenous people in the country, maybe 900,000. I mean, it was not overpopulated, but it was that sort of number. And by the year 1900, there were only 100,000. So, I mean, 90% had, had, had died. Uh, more than that, but th that was the net difference. Um, and that was due to the presence of, uh, of the white man. So, what I'm saying is, all those people that died, died. In, in despair. Yeah. And they, they knew what was happening. They knew the, their, their world was taken. They, they had been unsuccessful. They left others who they hoped would carry on, but they didn't know how successful they would be. So um, it's that balance. And I think, but of course we can't do it alone. We have to be interconnected. And, uh, and, we, and, and the compassion has to be not only for ourselves, but of course for others. And that's the sustaining force. And then through, through that sort of communal hope, uh, through that communal compassion, um, hope for, for, um, uh, for a solution of some sort may arise. Often, often if we're desperate, it's hard to know uh, what, what hope will look like. Or it's hard to know, in my view, sometimes what, what to hope for. So that's just a complicated um, and somewhat incomplete answer. But um, importantly, uh, in Buddhism, that's often where you are, isn't it? You don't have an answer. It's incomplete. It's conflicting. Nobody else can really give you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I've not always remembered Susan Murphy Roshi giving a talk once and saying that if you had aspirations to be a bodhisattva and you opened your heart to the world, you couldn't expect life to be continually happy <laughs> because just by opening your heart to the world, you are opening yourself to all of that suffering. Yeah. Well, that's right. And uh, I love that. Yeah. But, 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 but also you, you do develop a different relationship with disappointment. Because the, you know the bodhisattva, the compassion, and you maybe you're, you're trying to help somebody, and everything you're doing, and you think I'm a bodhisattva, I've got all this compassion, you know, I'm going to help you, and then the other person dismisses you. They don't see you as a as a bodhisattva. As a help. <laughs> as a help, then they they just dismiss you. They insult you. They may hit you. They may not give you any food into your arms bowl. <laughs> and and I and I imagine a bodhisattva would say thank you because you are confirming the nature of the world. You know, the, what, what I was consumed in my own expectation, that I had the compassion and the training and, um, you know, um, six years of meditation in a cave and I had everything and, um, 
<laughs> you've told me that I don't. You've taught me humility. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you. I have a quick question um, regarding like this, um, I guess, what we've learned. It seems to be quite like a combination of different branches of Buddhism and combined with kind of scientific um, like support from the person you said, which is Robert. Was it someone? Yeah, the one that started the Center of Wellbeing. So oh, just, yeah. yeah um, um, so yeah, I'm just curious as to like, how do we incorporate the learning from this into our practice? Um, and, you know, you also incorporated elements of Stoicism and Rumi, et cetera. Like what sort of your take on incorporating different sources of, um, you know, information that may not strictly be Buddhist, like Buddhist words, but sort of incorporating that into your practice? Well, I think it's, um, I mean, I think the, if you like, the, the rubber hits the road in, in our meditation. I mean, that's where things change. And it's really whatever works um, when you're there. And, um, and so I don't, I don't, well, in my view, and it's my view that we don't, we're not, that we're not confined to the suttas and, uh, and the Buddhist canon. You know, I mean, um, this, the, the, this, the, the, uh, there's resonance in other areas of human life, so in poetry. I mean, but only if the poetry works, only if it arouses your spirit and your heart and, and you have a, a degree of insight in reading the poem or looking at the work of art or whatever, you know, and then that you incorporate that into your practice. Um, so, I, so I think in any, uh, any lineage of Buddhism, there would still be variation if you went, say, into retreats. Uh, they were all in the, under the umbrella of, um, say, Theravada, Mahayana, you went to Theravada. Theravada, you know, there are probably a hundred different forms of practice depending on, on which branch of that, which country you're in. Um, even within Thailand, if you were going around the different forest tradition centers, you would, you would, you would see quite, quite a deal of difference. And um, I remember, I don't know if you know John Barta, many of you may know him, he was... Uh, He's moved out of Sydney, but he was uh, a monk for uh, from age 18 to 27. He's now in his 50s. Um, but he, 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 when he was in, he was about 20 and he went to Thailand and he was, um, became a, um, he joined Ajahn Chah, who was a very eminent um, Thai um, uh, monk, quite, quite very well known, very eminent. So John Barta, but he was a young man. Uh, and he had the energy of someone young, and he was determined to to pursue his practice. Um, but Ajahn Chah was just saying, just just meditate, you know, just get up. You you have your duties and so forth. You go on your arms round. Um, you live with the seasons, and uh, he gave occasional talks, um, and so nothing much was happening. And so John therefore heard that there was a great speaker at a, a you know. A, a, hundred kilometers away. So he went up there and spent some time. Then he came back all excited. And um, uh, he hadn't told Ajahn Chah where he had gone, but Ajahn Chah knew. I mean, he was in a deep meditative state and he could see John Barta walking away. He could see that. And he knew this other person. He could hear the words, you know, and then, uh, and so John Barta came back. So he had had this other experience and thought it was wow. And he's told Ajahn Chah, who said, oh, you see, you've had a wonderful time and you've heard some 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 great words, you know, from an eminent speaker. Now you have even more to forget. You've got even more to let go of. So I think what he's saying is, um, you 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 naturally go and and have your experiences in life, because I mean, your experience off the cushion and, and not on retreat, just in life, informs your spiritual practice. Because we 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 have our experiences from our teachers, and we read the suttas. They're presented to us in a particular way, depending on our tradition. And then we go out into life and we apply that and we learn from life. Um, but fundamentally, it's what resonates in our heart. And that's why this, the, the account of this um, young Tibetan, well, he's young to me, he's older than 
some of the people here, but anyway, he's a, a, a youngish man. Uh, but his his particular life story, you know, uh, I found moving. And the key is that it was moving because I could understand that he was in a, in a position in life and he, and he saw that he had to get out of that, even though it was a substantial, in his case, he was successful. I mean, he wasn't wealthy himself, but he was in a world where um, uh, he was being looked after. So he was wealthy, but he, materially he was well off. Everything was being done for him. He didn't have to, didn't have to pay for it. So often we see that, you know, in our life we realize that um, there's a certain dissatisfaction. We have to do something in our life, and it's really difficult because often we're sort of frozen by all our uh, responsibilities and uncertainties. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, have, have you? Did you have something more you wanted to say? Because it's nine oh three. That's a. Are we are we ready to finish? I think. Yeah. Right. Um, but thank you so much for you've given us well me in particular a lot to listen to and a lot of rich resources to um, look into. But um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here, and thanks, Jonathan very much for your talk again this week and hope to have you back again soon and thank you so much sarah for hosting the zoom tonight and thank you everyone for uh coming here and especially thank you jonathan so your teachings is like i will listen to your video again and again oh yeah by the way that um the talk is uh, will be recorded and i'll produce the video and put it on um our website as well as um, Facebook. So if you want to listen to Jonathan's teaching again, just go to AED's Facebook and then I'll post a video there. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night, Jonathan. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.